your host, Andrew Ingram, and every week I sit down with a different artist to talk about the things they make and their process for making them. This week on the show, I've got a very talented musician. His name is Ferret. You can find his album on Spotify. It's called All of Your Love. Um, it, it was a really cool conversation. It was nice to sit down and talk to him long form. Ferret and I have been uh, friends and friendly around town uh, for a long time, but I haven't been able to sit down and talk to him, you know, just the two of us one-on-one -on -one for an extended period of time before. So it was really cool to uh, sit down with him. He's a sweet guy. He takes his music very seriously. He's a music teacher. Um and uh that was it it was just it was just a a real fun conversation uh i think you guys are gonna like it um you should check him out on instagram at real men love ferrets and you should check out his youtube channel it's a ferret uh with an a e uh that's just some seo stuff guys you you a lot a lot of ferret videos on youtube um and uh, as for my stuff, uh, as always, you should check out my writing at mindfulofmadness.com. You should check out my comedy album, uh, This Was a Bad Idea, on Spotify or iTunes or Tidal, probably. Uh, I think Tidal gives me uh, more money than the other sites if you stream it there. So, you know, go, go do that. Um, <laughs> And as always, finally, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, that's how these things grow. I know it's kind of a pain. I know I ask every week. Um, but it would be cool if you could do that. It would really help me out. All right, guys. Uh, that's enough begging from me. Uh, let's get into this episode. Yeah. What's up? Um, I'm your host, Andrew Ingram, and with me this week is a good buddy of mine, a very talented musician. It's uh, Ferret, everybody. Hello, everybody. How's it going, buddy? Uh, it's it's going, you know. Yeah, still living in the weird times. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, we were talking before. Uh, Ferret is a music teacher as well as a brilliant musician talking about how He's had to uh, do his classes over Zoom for the past seven months or so. Uh, so, oh, and in the background, there's going to be a clock every once in a while. Uh, every 15 minutes. Every 15 say. minutes. That's a very Southern thing. Like, that's the most Southern thing I've ever identified about you. Because uh, um, you said you're from Texas, right? Yeah. So I was I, I was born in San Antonio, but like I, I've lived in Houston probably longer than anywhere. Which you you have a very Austin vibe about you, uh, so I mean, that's kind of surprising. I, I have spent a lot of time in Austin, but yeah, I, mainly from Houston. That's my place. Yeah. Um, what was what was it like being a creative person growing up in Houston? Uh, to be honest, like really crappy. It sucked. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I guess it worked out for Beyonce, but like she's the exception. Like, uh, I don't know. Houston is obviously pretty conservative, although not as conservative as you probably would think. Like right. it's surprisingly progressive in a lot of areas, but it, at its heart, it is like a conservative oil town. Yeah. And so like, uh, like, the arts just aren't really appreciated there. Like, open mics, as big as Houston is, like, it's harder to find an open mic there than it is here. Which is crazy, because this is <laughs> also one of the most conservative cities in the world. It, yeah. Or in, in, in the United States, at least. Yeah, and, like, I don't... I don't feel that here because like I'm from Texas and Texas felt so overwhelmingly like, mm -hmm. like oppressively conservative and like when I moved out here like the first thing I did was meet a whole bunch of artists and it's yeah, like yeah. they're just like crawling out of the woodwork here so it's uh I don't know yeah it's um I will say it was it's hard for me to remember as well um I, until you get out of that environment, which you live 
I would say almost exclusively in it at this <laughs> point between teaching music and making music. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but like, I didn't see this as anything other than like kind of a boring, conservative, uninteresting hellscape <laughs> uh, until I got out of the army and found out oh no, there's some really cool shit going on here. Yeah. Um, but then every once in a while I have to dip my head out for work or for, you know, family stuff, and I, I get reminded, oh, right, <laughs> this this is a very red town. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what, uh, what, if, I, I remember we were drunkenly, talk, or I was drunkenly talking <laughs> with you about this at, at an open mic a few weeks ago, but we, uh, uh, we were talking kind of about your background in music. Um, what eventually brought you to the Springs? Not music. <laughs> no? <laughs> so actually, like, I don't have a good reason for moving out here. <laughs> Like, I just, I really hated where I was so much. I hated living in Houston. I hated the kind of, like, bigness of it. I hated always sitting in traffic. I hated the people who are just, like, rude and just, like, just, like, mean on purpose. Like, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, the, that's a big difference between here and, and, like, there. Is that in, like, Houston, people are, like, just aggressively mean, like, to your face, and, and here I feel like it's a little more passive-aggressive. <laughs> That's, <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I just, I hated living there so much, and I wanted to move somewhere like that was the total opposite, and I guess this isn't really the total opposite, but, like, as far as, like, places I had been to before, this was, mm -hmm. like, where I wanted to be like it felt laid back and like small and like uh oh god too much coffee <laughs> <laughs> um it felt like uh closer to nature because like Houston is like just very urban and yeah industrial I, I've, <laughs> I've only ever driven through Houston your uh, uh overpasses are terrifying um mm -hmm. it's if you've never been to Houston, there are like four or five overpasses at, on top of each other in some places. Yeah. It's really weird. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and well, let me ask you this because I've never actually spent any time there. What's the... Uh, it's just a city in the middle of the Texas desert, basically. Uh, well, so, I mean... What are the borders of this city? How does it stop? <laughs> like, so I wouldn't describe Houston as like deserty at all. Uh, it's more like marshy, like swampy. Oh, okay. Like, is that because of the oil? Uh, well, it's we're it's really close to the coast. I don't think people realize really how close it is. Yeah. Like, I I kind of like. I spent a lot of time living in Galveston, which is like an island, I guess, south of Houston, and it's uh just it's actually an island but it's a really it's like trashy island <laughs> it sucks. um but uh yeah houston is like just a big swamp in the middle of a swamp and then all around it is just like all these like little redneck towns that are it's more like louisiana than texas honestly <laughs> <laughs> i i guess I, I never realized that <laughs> at all, uh, just driving through it. But that's that's really that completely changes kind of the way I see the city because I just see it as as hot and barren. But you're it is saying it's very hot, but yeah. also very moist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know if we ever got out of the car. That might be why I didn't pick that up. Um, what a so what was it like? I guess in that environment, how did you um, find music? What was it that brought you to it? Um, so uh, I actually went to school at University of Houston for, um, well, I was going there for a communications degree, uh, and like my emphasis was film. And like that was what I was really interested in at the time. And I was also kind of like just writing music just for fun <laughs> basically like I wasn't taking it that seriously but um, 
I met a few people in college who were musicians, and I was in some bands, and it was just like those were more fun people to be around than uh, than neurotic film people. Oh God, yeah. film people are the the worst people <laughs> on the planet. They're the the most pretentious <laughs> and just like egotistical on top of that. So like just awful. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then musicians are always really cool and laid back, and I was like, do I want to spend the rest of my life around these people or these people? And I, I yeah. chose I chose musicians because they're more fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I do think it's funny because I think across the board, artists are neurotic, mm-hmm. egotistical, nar- narcissistic people, but it's maybe because you don't have to talk to film people as often, or they're right. not... With the exception of directors who do seem to be on this kind of mountain, they don't get any airtime in interviews. So I wonder if the outside perspective is that it's it's musicians and, I mean, comedians are maybe just a notch below film people, <laughs> if I'm being honest. But I, I, I wonder what the, the outside perception is. Because I will agree, um, I think... I don't know that many film people, but I do know a, a lot of musicians and comedians. And musicians don't get into a lot of the bullshit comedians do. I'll, I'll say that right now. They, they don't go around punching magicians in the face. <laughs> We're not talking about that here. I'm not getting canceled in my own scene, man. Uh, there's a video online. If, if you're listening to it, you probably already know about it. But you can you can Google uh, blind, magi- blind comedian punches musician. I'm sure it'll come up. Uh, God, that was funny, though. Uh the whole situation is beyond stupid, but it is. I and I wasn't there, um, but uh, yeah, I would. I I would be interested to know what what the outside perception is on that. Um, so you, uh, w- we talked before about uh, a couple of the bands uh, you've you were you were in back in Texas. Um, what what's touring with it i don't know if you want to shout them out or not but what Uh, what's uh being in a band you know trying trying to make it that way like versus what what you're doing now uh it's it's like completely different (laughs) uh i'll say that like being in a band always felt like a lot easier and a lot more comfortable and a lot more safe and it's like having a band is almost like a more direct route to playing shows right because I never went to an open mic with a band before, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's always like you go directly from like playing in your garage to playing shows. And like in Houston, you get pretty big venues like pretty fast. Like I was playing at like House of Blues and stuff within like the first year of like this band existing. And uh, so, so it was always easy that way, but like you have like the creative conflict, like there's a lot more of that and a lot more of like just not getting your way and having to compromise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and as a solo musician, you never have to do that. Like do you think you're uh do, do you think that that compromise can lead to more interesting art or do you think it's it's it kind of hampers everybody? Um so I think this kind of relates to the film world is like the best films are made by the most people you know like you don't have like three people working on a film and it turns out to be like this masterpiece it's usually uh, like a hundred different people or more like contributing to this finished product and that's what makes it so like professional and like quality but like uh I feel like the same thing goes for being in a band. Like, if you have someone who only ever plays drums, they're obviously going to be a way better drummer than, like, someone who's just doing it because they have to. Right, because somebody has to do it, yeah. (laughs) So, like, uh, there is that. But, like, when you're dealing with, like, conceptual stuff or, like, just really, like, out there, like, big ideas, it's harder to get, you know, four or five people on the same page. Right. So... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's always 
that's a narrative and god god knows how much of it is true but you know the page plant kind of uh combative relationship making good art but i feel like for every one of those there's a thousand bands probably that just quit right you know? um what kind of music were you guys playing uh so like i was i was playing sort of like just punk like sort of emo pop punk stuff it was like yeah. what was popular and like uh it was mostly because that's all i could play at the time right. <laughs> <laughs> three chords and a girl who broke my heart <laughs> right and like i i wasn't really a very good singer at all back then and i was kind of like forced into that position so like punk you don't have to really sing that well you can mm -hmm. kind of just like shout with a lot of passion and people will be into it <laughs> so you're saying i still have a chance uh, <laughs> i'm not gonna lie at least once every six months i'm like i start a band i could i'm 32 but you know there's still time it's like i can't play anything and nobody wants me to wants to see me at a microphone singing but i i could start i could start a punk band i could do it fugazi man if you never try you'll never know and then i don't uh because uh uh wisdom is the better part of valor in this situation <laughs> um so were, was that what you were also like listening to, or is it just kind of, this is what we can play, so this is what we're doing? I mean, it wasn't really what I was listening to, but it was like kind of like the common ground between like most of my bandmates, like, b because I like a lot of different stuff, like, mm -hmm. I, and I honestly hate that question, like, what's your biggest influence, because <laughs> right. like, my, like, you know, Prince is as much of an influence as, like, System of a Down is. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, how do I draw a parallel between those two things? But like... I would have pegged Pence bef or Prince before <laughs> System of a Down, if I'm being honest. <laughs> but, uh, so, so yeah, like, I, I have a lot of influences, but, like, at the time it was easier to find people who are into, like, My Chemical Romance. And, like, so I, I like My Chemical Romance, so I've, like... You know, let's play music like that. Yeah. That's where we can kind of meet in the middle. <laughs> I would also say My Chemical Romance may be the closest thing to Prince <laughs> in pop punk, at least in the theatricality of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I agree, yeah. yeah I, uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe maybe Fall Out Boy would give him a run for his oh, money. I... Did, didn't that guy do, like, a soul uh, album? <laughs> You know, I don't know. I I feel like Fall Out Boy was something that like all my friends were into, but I never could get into. There's that clock again. Yep. <laughs> if you're if you're counting, it's been, it's 15, been 15 minutes. minutes. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, what was I saying? Uh, Fall Out. You were shitting on Fall, Fall Out Boy. Fall Out Boy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just I never got into them. I felt like they were like the um, the like Spice Girls of. <laughs> <laughs> of like the emo pop punk yeah. scene or whatever because like they were literally put together because Pete Wentz wanted to make an album and just found a bunch of session right the, the, <laughs> the bass player was the focal point of that band right uh <laughs> so yeah I, I never got into them but you know yeah I don't hate them I don't I I was very judgmental of that genre of music because I wanted to be a real punk. And, right. You know, like, was, who am I kidding? The biggest punk band when I was 12, 13 was Blink-182. It was like, it's <laughs> yeah. not like, it's not like I had a pedigree. I wasn't listening to uh, Fugazi in high school. I, I you know, I, I didn't know who Bad Brains was until I was a senior. It, like, I, yeah, like, I never, I tried really hard never to fall into that trap of, like, only listening to real music or right. whatever, because what does that even mean? And honestly, I've loved Destiny's Child since I was seven years old. They're beautiful singers! And you you can't love Destiny's Child and be a real, real punk, I guess, <laughs> so, you know what? Well, and also, you're from Houston, you know? It's, yeah. it, it, you, they throw a Destiny's Child CD at you, you know, in the delivery room. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, the, the, the whole, uh, 
influences thing is like a tricky thing for every musician. I think everybody kind of hates that question. Uh, and so here's another question that bothers people. Uh, where, what would you categorize what you do? Because I don't exactly know how to do it. Um, I would say there's, there's some power pop in there for sure. Um, but I don't, I don't exactly know where to go from there. Um, so probably like every album that I write is different. I've only like... As a solo musician, I've only really put one album like out on Spotify and everything, but I've honestly written probably three albums yeah. <laughs> by now. But like that one album has a vibe and it's sort of like a funky, like new wave, uh, kind of almost EDM vibe, but not quite. Uh, and my next album is probably going to be really different from that. Yeah. But I think I, I stay in the realm of writing stuff that's catchy and you know, like, something you can dance to. I, like, yeah. I I really, I appreciate a song that's able to make you dance and also able to make you think. Yeah. Um, those are, like, my favorite songs. So I, I, try to, I try to do that as much as I can. Sometimes I'm not trying to make you think at all. I'm just trying to make you dance. <laughs> yeah. But I'm always trying to make you dance, no matter yeah. what. <laughs> well, I would say, you know, a, a, a song like... Uh... Uh, a song like Girlfriend has that 80s dance pop vibe to it. Actually, I would say, actually that entire album it does have kind of a what if what if new wave was 20% fu more fun, <laughs> right. uh, you know, kind kind of yeah. vibe to it uh, that I really dig. Um so what what went into deciding what tracks went onto that? Because you do have a lot of songs. Yeah. Um, and, well, so I have like such a long process, uh, and it's a lot of just trying stuff out and then just completely scrapping it or like incorporating it into something else. So like for every ten songs that I actually release. I've written probably 30 to 50 songs yeah. and like played those at an open mic and it was either like, all right, that sucked or like, oh, I need to like make it faster or, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of trial and error before I end up with something. But then when I know what I want, it's like I recorded uh, like All of Your Love. I recorded it over the course of maybe three months. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I just knew exactly what songs were going to have the vibe that I wanted for that album. Yeah. And then I might release some of the other stuff that I've been playing like later, but it, yeah. it just wasn't for that album. Do <laughs> at, at, are you tinkering with songs after you take them to open mics because you're 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 an open mic warrior. Not a lot of musicians are. Uh but you go out a lot and test out songs. Are you are you asking is this song good or are you asking what works and can I fix it? Uh, all of the above. Okay. So, sometimes a song just doesn't work. Like, and, and actually, uh, there is one song that I actually put on my album. Uh, it's called Condoms in a Candy Bar. <laughs> and I've never been able to, uh, pull it off live. Like, it just never works live for some reason. But I love the recorded version of it so much. Like, I had to put it on the album. But usually, if something doesn't work live, I'll just scrap it like if i've yeah. tried it twice and i didn't get any reaction like it's gone completely okay uh but like sometimes they'll be like well they really liked the the bridge or or like this guitar solo was really cool but like everything else just dragged you know mm -hmm. they're not i'll just work that into a different song you know cool do let me ask you this do you think if you had a band behind some of those songs that that didn't work live that they would have for sure for sure yeah because yeah, my my biggest uh thing is like i can't i don't have any live drums so i have to use like looped drum beats and i can like add or subtract drums from that beat but it's always got to have like the basic like the same kick and snare through like the mm -hmm. whole thing uh and that's kind of limiting uh as to like what kind of songs I can play live 
Well, I'm gonna shut the window because. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it we're tr we're recording this on on a laptop microphone. I'm <laughs> I'm not that worried about sound quality. Clearly. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, so so like uh, some songs would work with live drums because they have that kind of dynamic energy. But like, you, like a lot of the times, uh, a lot of the rock songs you listen to don't have a consistent tempo through the whole thing, mm -hmm. and you don't really notice that like on its face. But when you try to play it with like a, like a drum machine, then it's like really apparent that like oh wow the chorus is supposed to be like just a little bit faster. Right. Like so. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. It's uh, I think that's, I'm trying to remember a YouTube clip that I think I listened to where they're talking about this and how this has changed over the past like 20 years. This has become more common that that the tempo changes slightly through throughout the song. Right. But that wasn't the case back in the day, uh, or not not the case as much at least. Um, what a um do do you think you would go back to a band if you found the right people um uh <laughs> or do you or at least let me ask you this if it was if it was the ferret project and it was <laughs> your vision would would you bring a backup band with you yeah for yeah. sure uh i kind i really like playing with loops I think it's a fun thing to do so I don't think I'd ever stop doing that completely like mm -hmm. if it was even if it was only a side project or something I'd always have like a looping project just because yeah. like it's a it's a really fun like it, it's it's limiting but sometimes like the m most creative ideas come out of limitations right so I like that Gee, about thanks it. Jack White. All right. Uh, <laughs> but like, uh, the, yeah, being in a band and being able to just like do everything that I want to do and like have all of my ideas come to life, like that, yeah, that would be ideal. Yeah. It's hard to get people together. Every, every time I see a band that works, uh, I wonder why I can't get five comedians to show up to a show on time you know <laughs> like, I'm like okay you guys are really good how'd this how'd this happen uh, you all showed up on time you loaded in efficiently what's going on here uh, I, I feel like the best bands like that uh are are like the ones that actually like don't spend as much time together <laughs> oh, right. like the ones that like just meet like once a week to practice they're like the ones that all show up on time and like do their part the ones that like see each other every day they're, they're the ones that have like issues we, we all live together but showed up in seven different cars for some reason exactly. there are five people in the band i don't know how this happened right. <laughs> yeah i uh um what a what drew you to just going out to open mics and trying stuff out? Um, I was bored. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, like, well, I moved, like I told you, I moved here for no reason, yeah. basically. And I just like, I kind of moved up here with what I could fit in my car. And like, basically that was just my guitar. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I started like just going to open mics just to like fill time because I didn't know anyone. Uh, and uh, yeah, like the first couple ones I went to were actually like really terrible. <laughs> yeah. But I just kept going for some reason. <laughs> Where were they? Let's let's talk about it. Who are we calling out here? Uh, Jives. Jives was the Jive. first okay. one I went to. And that's an all music one, so I don't think I've, I've ever yeah, played. Yeah, it was, it was like, I like the mixed open mics a lot more mm -hmm. because like they're... Uh, Cause, uh, it's easier for like comedians to support musicians and musicians to support comedians and uh, like all that than it is for like just musicians to support other musicians. Right, or, right. Like you were talking about like <laughs> comedians don't usually support other comedians. <laughs> yeah. And I guess maybe musicians are a little better about that, but like there is still that kind of like ev some people are just in it like for themselves and they right. don't care what anyone else is doing and like i really got that vibe there <laughs> yeah yeah uh and uh 
I don't know, but when like Zodiac was like the first place where I was like, oh, these are probably my people because they're mm-hmm. weird. No. <laughs> R.I.P. Zodiac. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, let's get that that project off the ground. Yeah. Uh, go check out uh, my episode with Andrea Stone for uh, for a deep dive into what went down with Zodiac. Yeah, I'm like halfway through listening to yeah. that one right it's now. It's a long one. It's, <laughs> it's a long one. Um, yeah. Uh, Zodiac, of course, was kind of the gold standard for for this scenes, um, this open mic the the open mic side of of this scene. Um, and honestly, for live for for punk and metal, it was a great place to perform too. Mm-hmm. Um, so with. Uh, with with looping how i'm i'm always i'm never because i don't know a lot about it i never feel like i can ask the right questions (laughs) but what what got you into looping in the first place because reggie watts is the first person i ever saw doing it you know who is a comedy person and it was it it was kind of a weird blend of 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 two different artistic disciplines but like i love reggie watts yeah uh but i i I don't have like a looping influence like because I didn't Mm -hmm. get into it that way I didn't get into it because like I saw other people doing it like I got into it because I wanted to be in a band (laughs) and I didn't have any bandmates and I didn't know anyone yet so like uh, I just bought a loop pedal and just tried to see how I could get it to sound like I was in a band (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, and so like the first like it the first few times I tried it out, I had no idea what I was really doing, but, like, by now, it's only really been, like, two years since I've started looping, and, like, mm-hmm. I, like, my mind just works that way yeah, now. Like, when yeah. I hear a song, I think about how I would loop it. <laughs> um, how, how is that discipline different than just playing? Um, it, it's different because you... Uh, you have to be multitasking, obviously. So, like, you have to be thinking about a lot of different things at the same time. And as a musician, what that kind of means is you ha- you kind of have to have a multiple things playing in your head at the same time yeah. and be able to, like, isolate those. Yeah. <laughs> which is, like, a big hurdle for a lot of musicians to overcome, which is why I constantly hear people saying, like, I couldn't do what you do. Like, I couldn't loop. Like, my mind doesn't work that way. But, like, it it really is just, like, kind of doing it enough to where you can isolate those different things you're hearing in your head and bring them to life, like, Mm -hmm. however you have to do that. Uh, And, like, you have to really have, like, an internal, like, metronome going for sure. It's been another 15 (laughs) minutes, guys. Um, Well, how... um... Do you think that that has made you more, um, let's say, a a more complete songwriter? Do you, do you feel like you understand more of the of the structure of how it all works because uh, you're doing more of it? Definitely, uh, and like I've always considered myself like a songwriter first. Like even mm-hmm. like just before I'm a musician or a performer, like. I'm a songwriter like songwriting is my passion it's not like playing I love playing guitar that's just fun (laughs) but like songwriting is my passion uh um and and so what I really love about looping more than anything is that I can like lift the veil a little bit and show people like what the process of songwriting actually sort of looks like because most of the time they only see the finished product and they think like it just comes out of the ether or whatever but I'm like showing you like right in front of your face like putting together a song piece by piece right you're building it (laughs) it is a it is a fascinating thing watching uh watching you or Salstro uh who are the two people I see at open mics using loops the most um watching you guys build something especially for the first time if if it's something new that i haven't heard before because sometimes it sounds batshit insane at first you know <laughs> right. it's like what are you doing <laughs> Wait, you know especially him using his mouth for most of it yeah um or you you know you you'll get the you'll usually get the drum beat down first right mm-hmm. and then um 
you'll get like a a basic riff you can build off of and this if i and and then from there you kind of start doing weirder things um <laughs> there are sometimes some songs you you loop vocal sometimes right yeah yeah um and and watching it build into to to this like it's a little um there there's a little bit of anxiety at the beginning of any loop song for me that I'm like I don't know if this is going to work out. <laughs> Let's we'll see. Well, it's it, so like one thing I have to keep in mind like I was talking about limitations with the loop pedal that I use specifically, I um can only remove my last layer of whatever I looped. Mm-hmm. So, um I kind of have to put the song together with that in mind. <clears throat> so like a lot of the time I do start with the drums because I usually don't ever take away the drums. But sometimes I need to take away drums or like mm-hmm. sometimes I don't want the drums to come in until like halfway through the song. So then I have to like end up looping those later and that's pretty hard because you have to <laughs> be, you have to have like perfect tempo with the guitar and then bring in the drums later and if you don't have perfect tempo it sounds just like shit it sounds awful yeah so <laughs> there with your with your pedal you can cut it out and then bring it back though you can cut out the whole thing and bring it back right? yeah because you do that on a couple of songs and I sometimes i like slow it down to half time and very rarely i'll reverse the whole thing. oh okay yeah but cool. sometimes i do all that stuff <laughs> yeah what a it's it's such like it's not even something i thought about until a couple of years ago, you know, it just wasn't something I'm, I was aware of. So it's like, if I don't need another hobby, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, maybe I could fuck around with that, you know, but like I, I do so many other things. My wife would just get mad. It's like, oh, really? There's one more thing that you're going to do. So we're not hanging out. Uh, <laughs> I was like, no, I'm just interested. <laughs> um yeah i would be bad i'm pretty positive as all evidence in my life leading up to this has me to believe i'd I'd be pretty terrible at it and get bored after a week but i don't want to drop a hundred bucks on it or whatever a loop pedal cost just to find out Um, (laughs) so um do you have plans on what's coming next um, or, or are you just writing songs right now? So, yeah, I've been, uh, you know, going through my process of just writing a bulk of songs that I'm probably not going to do anything with. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, like, trying them out at open mics. Um, but now, I, like, I have a concept for what I'm going to do on my next mm-hmm. album. So I'll, I'll go ahead and just say it. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to... So I'm going to write an album uh, that basically has one drum beat uh, or just like the kick and the snare are in the same place for 45 minutes. Okay. I'm going to put like nine or ten songs within that 45 minute span, but they're all going to flow into each other and have that sort of like EDM drum beat going the whole time. Because like that's the feel I wanted it. I wanted to use live instruments to create the feeling of like listening to a DJ or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Are you big into that scene? Do you like a lot of EDM stuff? Yeah, like a lot of my favorite music is like electronic music. And it's weird because like most of my like absolute favorite bands have zero guitar. (laughs) (laughs) And like, but I try to like replicate those like synth sounds or whatever, like with my guitar. Mm -hmm. And it's like, like I... uh, You're you're a millennial uh, uh, Tom Morello. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, hey. Um, but like, yeah, I love like, uh, Crystal Castles was like one of my favorites. Uh, The Knife was like a really big influence. I don't think I know The Knife. You need to listen to The Knife. Actually, the, uh, the way I sing, uh, is really influenced by Karen Anderson. She also has a solo project, uh, Fever Ray. Okay. So check both of those out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking amazing. But like, uh. <clears throat> she she does this thing with her vocals where she kind of like adds like uh harmonies that she like 
pitched down so like it sounds like a man's voice so she's singing in like a man's voice and a woman's voice at the same time and like there are a few songs where i try to use my harmon uh, like my harmonizer pedal to do that same thing mm-hmm. uh i just i think it's a really cool sound. yeah that that is really <laughs> cool it it's it seems like that would be the hardest thing in the world to do live <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. Again, another one of those anxiety things where there are a lot of there are a lot of knives in the air right now. You're right. juggling. Um, it's almost like a one man band thing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so yeah, I uh, um, since uh, since talking to CJ because he's got the prefab soul. Um, yeah, project. I've been like dipping my toes into more electronic music because it's, again, I was the opposite of you. I was very pretentious without a right to be about <laughs> what I liked and why I liked it. Um, but like it is, it's all the same DIY ethic that I subscribe to, you know, with with everything with art in that somebody's in their room making this by themselves and just kind of throwing it out in the world and that's always what i've appreciated about punk rock it's always what i've appreciated about um the way most of the comedians i like do things um so i i feel like on ethic alone i need to understand (laughs) this this uh this genre of music that i haven't ever given fair shrift to so so you said the knife uh crystal castles i know a little bit who else should i be checking out uh so um i guess it's it's yeah it's electronic tune yards uh i've really been into lately oh jack stauber uh he's like right now like he's like uh who i'm probably listening to the most yeah uh and we we have a pretty similar sound i guess you could say but uh yeah he does a lot of electronic stuff but also plays guitar sometimes and yeah Mm -hmm. it's like uh right up my alley nice Um, nice i will check them out (laughs) i appreciate the uh the the recommendations (laughs) um well let's talk about uh teaching music a little bit I, um were you doing that back in texas or is that just the job you found when you got here um yeah it well it was the first job i found when i got here I, like it was like like a like a movie i <laughs> i literally was just walking past the store and they had like a a, a flyer saying they were hiring music teachers um it, it's uh music and arts like they hadn't opened yet when i mm-hmm. first came here um, so I was like one of the first people they interviewed and got hired like right away. And like I had never taught music or anything before, yeah. so like it was a little weird. But I ended up like really loving it like immediately because mm-hmm. uh, I like to talk about music and like yeah. I have an excuse now. <laughs> so <laughs> you paid me to be here, so you have to listen. Exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> what are most of your clients like are are they they kids adults or is it just everybody um it's everybody uh like i will say overwhelmingly it's like kids between the age of like 11 and 16 like that's when most people learn to play guitar mm-hmm. i guess uh but you know i've i've had like 35 uh, year old guys just like hey i really want to learn these slayer songs <laughs> like, all right we'll get there <laughs> just like okay here's how you play farmer in the dale and uh, uh now do that uh for the next ten thousand hours and maybe you can play rain pod uh, um what uh what style do you like teaching the most or is is that even a part of it um so i like i encourage people to like have their own style uh and and i have a pretty broad range of music that i listen to anyway so i really it's hardest for me to teach country music because i just don't appreciate it as much as people (laughs) want me to like and i'm from texas and so everyone's just like what and i'm like oh 
I grew up in the city. Like, no one I knew listened to country okay, music. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, like, I just never had an appreciation for it. But, like, so that one's hard for me. Yeah. But I still do it anyway. Yeah. I mean, that being said, you were in a punk <laughs> band. And, like, I mean, I guess if they want to want to play, I don't even know who's popular right now. If they, But if they want to play pop country, I can. But, like, punk rock and Johnny Cash are the same thing. Yeah, well, like, Johnny Cash is, like, I mean, I most people aren't wanting to learn that kind of oh, country. Okay. I mean, and, and honestly, like, yeah, I, I can understand Johnny Cash, but, like, if you're wanting to learn, uh, what's his, Blake Sheldon, that's oh. when I get a lot of, or uh, who's the guy, Brad Paisley. Yeah. <laughs> you only want to learn this to get laid. <laughs> Fuck right. you, bro. <laughs> yeah i'm i'm working with a lot of guys right now who like i i don't want to talk shit they're mostly okay guys but like i very much get the vibe that every single skill they've ever learned in their life was specifically to get laid (laughs) and it's like i don't know how to talk about anything with you man (laughs) this is this is weird uh uh it's like, yeah, 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 I learned free fall and it's panty dropper. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> like, all right. Oh, so you don't actually like Tom Petty. You just <laughs> like getting laid. That's fine, I guess. Um, what a, uh, with, so with, with some of the older, what's, what's the difference between teaching kids and teaching older folks? Um, Older people have a harder time with like the the physical aspect of playing guitar. Like they just can't get they their already fingers. Have their, yeah, yeah. Like they can't get their fingers right, or you know, they they're just like they can't strum fast. Uh, but like for kids, they just forget everything like five minutes later. <laughs> And, like, they, they build muscle memory really yeah. well, which is something that, like, I've recognized. So I just have them, like, repeat the same kind of, like, drills over and over again. And that, like, just gets them to where they can play something, whether they like it or not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, like, getting them to, like, remember a concept or something is so difficult. Yeah. Like, they have no attention span, so. <laughs> <laughs> the- I and we were talking about how you're doing this all over Zoom before. Um, yeah. What uh, I know we talked off uh, off mic about this, but what are some of the challenges for doing that versus in person? Um. So there's like a small sound delay on Zoom, like it's just a less than a second, mm-hmm. but it's enough to where we can't share a metronome or play at the same time because it's not going to ever be in sync. Right. So you can only have one person playing the guitar at a time. And also Zoom does this thing where if both like uh, if both people are making noise at the same time, whatever the loudest one is, like, gets muted or something like that. Like, okay, it just randomly decides to mute people sometimes. And so it makes it like really, really hard. <laughs> Uh, you just, you just have to, like, say something and wait, or, like, have them play something and then just wait a little bit before you start talking. It's, uh, so there's that. And then also, like, the, the fact that you can't, like, pick up their guitar and, like, show them on their guitar what they're supposed Mm -hmm. to be doing. Like, because that's something I would do a lot. Right. So, yeah. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I can't imagine. Uh, I, I literally, I would lose my mind. Have you been, that being said, are, th- are there like benefits to doing Zoom? Like, have you been able to get more clients this way or anything like that? I have absolutely not been able to get more clients this way. Like, quite the opposite. Nobody wants to learn guitar on Zoom. Like, right. they want to do it in person. Uh, and I've lost, I've definitely lost a lot, like, since March. Um, but, uh, I mean, it, it's cool that yeah, you can, like, share a screen or whatever mm-hmm. so that, like, you can both be looking at the same, like, piece of music or whatever. But I can do that in person, too, so... <laughs> yeah, so it's mostly just a crap shoot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, buddy. <laughs> um what what are some 
I don't. I. I mean, maybe I should be paying for this. But what are some? Uh, what are some tips you have for somebody who's been thinking about picking up an instrument, but hasn't done it yet? What What are some ways to stay motivated and actually do it? Um, stay motivated. Uh, learn learn songs that you want to learn. I mean, that's how I started on guitar. That's how I teach my like my students. Mm-hmm. Like, I teach them the songs that they tell me they want to learn. Um, and like. Cause, cause that's like the biggest way to get uninspired with an instrument right. is learning like farmer in the devil. Right, like right. nobody wants to learn that. So just skip to the songs that you want to play, you yeah. know. And also, um, uh, I I would say it's not as much fun as playing the songs that you want to play, but learn music theory. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause I, I've met so many people who've said like, uh, no, if I learn theory, then I'm just going to play like everyone else. And I'm like, you mean good? Like the way it sounds good? Uh, yeah, you are going to play that way. Yeah. That's the idea. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, that goes to, uh, that, that goes to like a, I, I've probably gone on the episode or many, many times on different episodes, but, um, the idea of skill versus talent versus hard work. And I feel like, uh, or, or I'm sorry, skill, skill and hard work. I see as the same thing. Uh, then you have talent, then you have, have luck with any artistic endeavor. Um, and you can't control the talent and you can't control the luck, but you can control the hard work. And, and that's, that's what the music theory is. It's, it's putting in the time to actually understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Yeah, and it's like, it's a it's a fail-safe. It, it helps so much, like, because uh, when you get up on stage and, like, you forget how to play a song, like, mm-hmm. that happens more often than you would think. <laughs> but I'm able to kind of, like, save myself because, like, if I know what key it's in, like, I can figure it out because I right. know the math behind it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um... Whereas, like, if I didn't know music theory, I'd just be, like, playing random notes until something sounded right. And Yeah, that's that's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Well, I feel like we're at the at the point in the show where we want to start talking about business, which, I mean, you do make you do make your living doing um, uh, uh, teaching people music. Is that something you kind of feel like you'd like to do forever? Or do you want to eventually make your income through the art you create um i'd be happy with teaching forever yeah. <laughs> i mean like i really there's nothing i really don't like about it so mm-hmm. like i am definitely happy teaching but also like you know i do want to uh make more money off of just being a musician and selling my music and like uh it's it's hard to make money as a musician especially in 2020 but like just like you know these streaming services don't really pay well at all no they don't (laughs) and like uh it's even getting to the point where like like shows don't even really pay that well unless you're selling a lot of merchandise so like merchandise is kind of what you have to make your money off of um your stickers are dope (laughs) i really like your stickers (laughs) well uh i made those at the library for free uh and i know okay so i need to say this because i I feel like this will apply to anyone who's listening to this yeah go to the library and utilize that resource because Mm -hmm. you can do so much for free yeah so much like any merchandise I've ever made, I made it for free at the library. I did not know that was an option. Yeah, you can... They have a sticker maker they, at the library? They do, and they have a button maker, and they have a, 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 a screen printer, um, a, a glass engraver, they have a 3D printer. All this stuff you can use for zero money. Yeah. <laughs> you, just, uh, you just have to go in when their maker space is open. And also, they have recording studios. So, mm-hmm. like, I recorded a lot of my vocals at the library because uh, I don't have, like, I'm not going to do it in my closet. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, the library was, like, my best option. Uh, and also, um, they have a, a, a soundstage for, like, making videos and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. I did a, I did a weird... Uh, uh, 
comedy and religion thing, which wound up just being more of a religion thing than, <laughs> than a comedy thing. But, I mean, it was fun to do. It was just like, I thought we were supposed to be funny. I don't know if we accomplished that, but sure was interesting. Um, yeah, I got to get more onto that. Uh, the, the downtown space for the library is, is really impressive. And uh, there's, like, so many libraries. Sand Creek has the uh, audio recording studio, and I think it's 21C has the uh, mm -hmm. sound stage. Um, but every library has, like, a maker's space where you can, mm -hmm. like, make stuff. And, uh, like, a lot, so many people don't know about that. Yeah, I gotta go make some merch for free. Exactly. Yeah. Make some t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, what... What do you think the the path forward for for making more money or making making a living or even subsidizing your living is? Um, I think as an artist, you have to get comfortable with making money in multiple different ways. Mm -hmm. There's never gonna be one thing that makes all your money for you. And so, as a musician, you can uh, like teach like I do you can use your music for soundtracks like that's a big thing that I kind of want to get into yeah. honestly uh and you know there, there's always like some alternate way to use your art rather than like the first thing you thought of yeah yeah <laughs> um and, and you usually make more money doing those things than like just the traditional route or whatever right yeah which is real sad. like most comedians make their living or most most quote unquote successful comedians make their living doing commercials doing or you know writing for uh commercials <laughs> or uh <laughs> you know you know uh, uh uh you know there there are there are comedians out there who i think have made more money off of cameo than they make at their shows <laughs> at this point you know it's uh it's a weird it's a weird world we're living in where everything the ease of access has demonetized everything so making an album is easier than it's ever been it was working with soda to make my album was i would say 50 times easier than i thought it would be uh you know, and it's it's not the highest quality album in the world, but you hear my jokes, and I think the jokes are of a high quality. Mm -hmm. So I'm 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 proud of that album. But we just we just two people made that, <laughs> you know, and it didn't cost us any money. It right. it was all stuff we already had. You know, he had the record recording equipment for when he he made his album, and I had the space and the material and we just made it and it wasn't that hard <laughs> um but that means everybody can do it and if everybody can do it that means there's more of it and if there's more of it right. that means it it is worth less not that it's worthless <laughs> it's <laughs> it's worth less sort of uh yeah um which is a weird space to be in because, um, I mean, I talked on the last episode how, you know, I don't expect to make a lot of money off this podcast. I, it is technically monetized and I made about five bucks, which is cool. Uh, but it's, you know, the, the goal is to drive traffic to the other things I do. Mm -hmm. And then my writing doesn't really make any money, but it also drives traffic traffic to the other things I do and right. if, and my comedy hopefully drives traffic to the other things I do then if enough people like enough of my stuff maybe I can make a living in 10 years you know <laughs> if I have a large enough catalog but uh yeah it's a it's it's a weird it's a weird symbiotic system and it's all things I like to do, but there's so much of it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think it's kind of cool that it's that way now. I feel like it, this is the first time in history, like it's really been that way for artists mm -hmm. where they have to have so many different things going on mm -hmm. at the same time. 
since since maybe the renaissance <laughs> right. right but it's like it it's kind of cool because uh you get to explore like different at like different aspects of art like like i i paint <laughs> yeah you're but really good almost at almost nobody knows that i even do that but like yeah i paint and every now and then i'll sell a painting but it's just like that's another thing that i can yeah. you know that i can do for fun and maybe make a little bit of money off of mm -hmm. and if you have a thousand things that you do for fun and make a little bit of money off of then you know you, you have a thousand dollars yeah <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> Let me ask you this: Having an, I, I ask everybody who's on the show who has uh, art out that's monetized in some way. You're on Spotify as well. Do you check the artist app? No, no. <laughs> I do it every day. Why? I can't stop. I don't. Uh, I can't stop. Uh, but uh, there is something I, I, I wanna, I wanna. Um, this is probably a better off-air conversation, but something I want to do is um, talk to a bunch of the um, a bunch of the musicians and uh, well, it's mostly musicians and me who who have albums actually out on these platforms and figure out a way that we can game the system <laughs> to start making each other money and just make playlists that oh my god yeah that we like. <laughs> Okay, this is Andrew's playlist. We're gonna listen to this on Monday. It's got all of Andrew's stuff and all of Ferret's stuff and all of uh, and, and all of Soda stuff and the mostly don'ts are on there and just like everybody play this on repeat for the next twenty four hours, <laughs> and then on Tuesday we're gonna do Ferret's playlist. It's a different playlist, but it's got all the same stuff on it. That's kind and... of that's kind of brilliant. <laughs> so I have a, I have a dream of Colorado Springs like just having this big scene build out of nowhere. I think that's the way to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just start. I there was I, I heard about this on another podcast. I don't even remember who the band is, but they and you can't do this anymore because Spotify found out and they um, stopped it. They released an album of silence, <laughs> and then just told all their fans to listen to it every night while they're sleeping, and that album gave them enough views that they got to go on a festival tour wow <laughs> like i i don't think it was i it was one of these metal festival tours i don't remember which one i don't even remember who the band is but like and then you know spotify found out and made it so you can't do that anymore mm -hmm. but like <laughs> that's pretty cool <laughs> um but yeah, I we, we should we should uh, get like a text chain going yeah. with with people and figure out how to how to approach this. <laughs> uh, where are we at? Oh, we're we're at like an hour oh, exactly. Uh, in about ten seconds, you're gonna hear the clock again. Yeah, All it's right. gonna be great, and then <laughs> and then we can start wrapping up. <laughs> I'm I'm really a couple of these bloated out really hard. Oh, there it is, and I am trying to to keep them under an hour and a half uh you know, keep them between an hour hour and a half because i i am not famous enough to have a four hour long <laughs> podcast uh, uh also i'm not sure i want to be that guy so um yeah but ferret what are what are the things you're doing right now that you want people to know about uh well the first thing uh i want you to listen to my album it's called all of your love it's on spotify bandcamp youtube everything uh it's f-a-e-r-r-e-t that's important to keep in mind f-a-e-r-r-e-t <laughs> Um, and then, uh, yeah, look up my music videos on YouTube. I'm trying to... Oh, we didn't even talk about the... You, you gave me such a... Such, <laughs> I, I, went to, I went to film school, and in the back of my head, I was like, right, and he has music videos. We got to talk about that. And then I'm a bad host, is what happened. Uh, I, I really like your music videos. They're very good. I, I enjoy Thank them you. a lot. Yeah, uh, I'm going to try to make a lot more of those like in the very near future. Uh, so I'm definitely going to put out some new videos before I put out my next album. Uh, so subscribe to me on YouTube. Again, 
F A E R R E T. Um, yeah. Uh, What's going to show up if we do the other one? Just uh, just a lot of ferrets playing around okay. in ball pits yeah. and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh no! I made a mistake and now I'm having the best afternoon ever. Uh, I didn't hear my friend's cool music, but I sure did have a good time. Um, yeah, so uh, your album, your YouTube channel, you got anything else going on? Uh, I mean, no. <laughs> right, the, Not right now. Well, I, would you like, you have a fan page on Facebook, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, follow Ferret on Facebook, and if you want guitar lessons, if you're not, if your schedule is not too full. Oh, for sure it's not. <laughs> yeah, re- reach out and get some guitar lessons. Uh, pay this, but because he's paying more of his bills that way than, you know, any way else. Right. So, uh, yeah. Um, and as for me, as always, uh, the album, uh, this was a bad idea on Spotify, iTunes, give it five stars that would be great because i think it has three ratings uh and it's got a lot of listens on spotify but no listens on itunes Mm -hmm. um and uh yeah uh go to mindful of madness for my writing uh and rate review and subscribe to the podcast that would be nice um and you know even if you're just watching it on uh youtube give it a thumbs up to get that algorithm cooking. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, Go make stuff.